Good morning, colleagues, uh, and welcome to the 25th meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, can I can remind all members and anybody else in attendance to please switch off their mobile phones or at least put them into a mode that won't interfere with proceedings. Uh, before I begin the, the, the normal part of the business this morning, I'd like to thank Christine O'Neill, who's been our constitutional issues advisor for the past two years. Committee members will agree that her hard work, clear and detailed advice was greatly supported. Uh, sorry, greatly supported and enhanced the committee's work. I'd also like to take the opportunity to welcome, welcome Professor Tom Mullen as our new constitutional issues advisor, and I look forward to him attending committees in the future. Uh, the first item on our agenda today is to decide whether to take items four and six in private. Our members are agreed. agreed. Members are agreed. The next item on the agenda is to take evidence from the Scottish Government's nominees to the Scottish Fiscal Commission. We're joined today by Professor David Ulf and Professor Francis Beaton. And members have received copies of their specification for the role, along with their application forms and CVs. But before we go to any questions that members may have of our two professors, I just wonder if, if either or both of you would like to make an opening statement. OK, I'm... Professor of Economics at the University of St Andrews. Most of my research throughout my life has been on issues relating to public policy, including understanding the effects of taxes and benefits on individual behaviour. In fact, the first piece of research I published when I was a lecturer at Stirling University was to look at the effects of income tax on individual labour supply. I also have direct experience of forecasting tax revenues because I was chief economist and director of analysis at initially Inland Revenue and then HMRC between 2001 and 2006. And as such, I was personally accountable for the forecast of all tax revenues and for the production of the figures for national income. Now, some of the things that came across to me from, from holding that post was, first of all, I saw the pressures that arose on tax forecasts when these were done for the Chancellor through HM Treasury. And I, I must admit, that made me a fan of independent tax forecasting bodies like OBR and the Fiscal Commission. Also, I have overseen a major review of the way in which we forecast corporation tax revenues at Inland Revenue. Um, initially that was done from a very microeconomic space and then scaled up. And we switched from that to a, a more macro-based way of forecasting. And that turned out to be a more successful way of forecasting with much lower errors on it. I also oversaw some changes in the way we forecast income tax revenues through taking more account of income distribution questions. Finally, I just want to say I have a, a number of areas of experience of giving independent advice to various bodies. So I am a member of the NHS pay review body. I've been a member for three years, and my appointment has been renewed for a further three years. I also sit on the Competition Appeals Tribunal. I've been a member of that since last year. Francis? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm um, a Professor of Economics and Finance at uh, Queen Mary University, London. Um, my background is, well, certainly in the early part of my career, very much involved in particularly macroeconomic forecasting. So I started off in the London Business School in their macro forecasting group and then moved to uh, the Bank of England where I headed up the, um, the forecasting group or coordinated forecasts uh, that were done there. Um, in terms of uh, academic research, I'm work largely uh, in finance, but also in macroeconomic policy issues. So I've uh, worked particularly on things like quantitative easing recently. Um, and then in terms of policy background, I guess uh, things to highlight with a key one, I guess, is, is I undertake a role similar but different to this one for the uh, states of Jersey. So I'm uh, on the fiscal policy panel for uh, for Jersey. I also have, like, like uh, David, sort of experience of, of policy reviews. So I've been in the policy review of uh, uh, local government finance uh, 
uh, one on the um, uh, foreign exchange reserve uh, management for the Treasury, uh, and also a work for the Central Bank of Iceland on um, their exchange rate uh, policy, as well as for um, the uh, Norwegian Ministry of Finance on uh, the allocation of their sovereign wealth fund. So a broad sort of finance macro uh, experience. Thank you much, Francis. Uh, a note from both of your respective um, CVs and some of the material you just presented us with in your opening statements. You've had experience, obviously, in the fields of forecasting and finance and economics. Um, I just wonder, though, if you could tell the committee any specific experience you've had in respect to, of production or analysis or forecasting relating to the Scottish economy or finances, or indeed such other work that you've undertaken uh, in that regard that might be helpful to under, in, in contributing to the Scottish scene. So. Well, I can say that um, for a while I was an advisor to the Committee of the Scottish Parliament that was taking the Scotland Bill through the Scottish Parliament. So as part of the work of doing that, we both scrutinised uh, evidence given by various experts on the potential impact of um, the devolved taxes to Scotland, as well as working with SPICE to produce our own forecasts of tax revenues in Scotland. So I have some experience through that. Okay. I have to confess I have no experience in, in Scotland, so my experience is, is broad uh, in the UK as a whole, but also uh, to do with the work. And I guess the, you know, the key experience, similar, as I said before, is, is working. It's, it's interesting as well. So is there some other comparators you can draw out that help us? Well, I think, uh, yeah, so Jersey, you know, it, it, it is an interesting experience but in the sense that they, they are, you know, very devolved. I mean, they are in, in their own uh, world. And I, and I think, as David was saying, I think the, you know, the, the role of the independent commission is very clear in, in there. There, there's less of a political, there's more just a technical uh, deficit in terms of, you know, th trying to uh, improve forecasting techniques. And I think that's one of the roles that I do, do there. And I think I would like to carry on here, which is, you know, to work with the t with the team on on some of the more, the more technical issues of forecasting to to make sure that you know, things are as done as efficiently and as you know in the most sort of uh, up to date way as as possible. So that's uh, certainly an area that I, from my Jersey experience, I like to bring to Scotland. Okay, thank you, Francis. Murder. Thank you, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, w one of the issues this committee has looked at. Uh, in recent weeks has been the divergence in forecast between the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission. And this has, has quite serious implications in terms of the fiscal framework, um, because uh, if, a, if there is a divergence that then leads to uh, uh, a, a gap which then needs to be reconciled against outturn figures when it, when it appears. And one of the things the committee has, has, has considered fairly briefly is, is there more that could be done to try and align the forecasts between OBR and the Fiscal Commission, given that both organisations are starting with the same raw data, but seem to be arriving at different conclusions which are presenting some challenges? So I wonder if that's an issue you, either of you have any thoughts on. Well, I think it depends, depends a little bit about on, on how the tax forecasts are, are actually done. Um, if you're just trying to produce a forecast, which is a number, it's a point forecast, then there's always the problem that you can never forecast with absolute precision. And that was the problem we faced when I was at HMRC. You, don't, you can forecast within ranges of accuracy. So it's possible that even with the same underlying approaches, you can come up with two numbers which are different, but if they lie in the same range, in some sense they are equivalent. So without knowing in more detail precisely how OBR does its forecast, because I haven't been part of OBR to, to see how they do that, it would be hard to see exactly... The, the devil's in the detail with this stuff. It may be there are some things they do in their, the way they forecast, which is different from the methodology that's being used in, with the Scottish Fiscal Commission. So even if you start from the same data, if you use that data in slightly different ways, you come up with different numbers. But I agree with your, your general point. It, it is really difficult to manage a situation where you have two numbers coming up from apparently authoritative bodies. It's a really difficult me message to manage. 
Yeah, I guess you know, to add to that, I think you know, in some sense, it, you know, it's a difficult area because I think one of the things that I would feel is important is that the, you know, the commission feels it is completely in, is independent and independent from the OBR, and therefore should be, you know, using its own skill and judgment and and techniques. But clearly, I think as David said, what well, obviously the ideal is if the commission does something that is better or you know different, and that there is a discussion internally with the OBR and, and an agreement about how to proceed. But as I say, I think there should be a presumption that, you know, that, that both parties should, you know, they shouldn't be forced to come together too early in the process. I think it should be ideally brought together before it finishes, but but not, you know, but there should be an, a degree of independent thought going on in the process early on, at least in the process. Okay. Should I ask any other question, James? Yeah. Yeah, you go. Uh, thanks, Kim, and uh, good morning. As the Scottish budget has evolved and we've picked up more tax raising powers because of the lag in term, and, and delay in terms of the publication of outturn data, uh, the role of the Fiscal Commission is really crucial in terms of providing forecasts which uh, lay the basis of some of the, the, the budget which is ultimately agreed um, by Parliament. Um, so. The accuracy of those forecasts is important not only for the government, but also um, if, if they change over time, they can become, you know, politically challenged. Um, so, from that point of view, it's welcome that you, in your CV and your statements, you've you've given explanation of forecasting experience. Just to drill down on that a bit. Um, one of the areas that's, that's very important in accurate forecasting is. Uh, reliable data sources, good data collection, and then feeding that into an appropriate financial model. Can you give it, maybe give a bit more explanation of your experience in, in managing uh, those scenarios? Well, in terms of managing some of the issues around data, um, when, when I first joined Inland Revenue, I assumed I'd be walking into an organisation with a vast amount of terribly accurate, up-to-date data from all the, the taxpayer returns. And I found that for some areas that's true. For some areas where it's computerized, there's some pretty accurate information there. But there are some other areas of information where we needed to drill down into some of the data. And we had to go down into the basement of Somerset House, get out stacks of paper records, and transcribe those into our data sets before we could do the analysis. So having good systems for collecting data is really important. And even then, things can go wrong. I had an experience where we had to pool the national income statistics for the UK for a period of six months because we found that the, the systems were not properly capturing data where people had, say, multiple partnerships it would capture the first page of the partnerships, but it would skip all the other partnerships. Now, at the level of national income, that didn't show up at all. But because MPs were very interested in what was happening in their constituency, once we drilled down to the constituency level and asked questions about it, what's happening to the, the high, high net worth individuals in this constituency, we saw huge changes from one year to the next. And that's what alerted us to the fact that the system was going wrong. So we actually had to stop the whole system of producing national income forecasts till we rectified the problem with the computer system and then go back and reproduce the national income forecasts. So these are, are tricky problems. Even with the most sophisticated uh, machinery around, you can find the data sometimes just gets lost in the, in the computer programs. Um, yeah, so mine explains more in, in, in the actual sort of building of forecasting models and um, how those are done. And I guess I started in the era of uh, uh, you know, large-scale econometric models, so sort of 500-plus equation models, which are less popular now. Um, and, I th and I think the, you know, that's something that I think is interesting to look at, is what, you know, what techniques have improved and what things uh, we can carry on pushing forward, because you know, particularly with... The availability. I mean, they, fortunately, data is no longer kept in cupboards anymore. That it is, it is. There is much more uh, accessible information, and I think these very large-scale estimation techniques, which you know can go down to individual levels, I think those are you know those are techniques that are 
going to come to the fore in the next few years where we can actually forecast from individuals pretty much uh, where which we couldn't we wouldn't we weren't able to do that before Emma I'm interested in just a, a, a wee quick question. When, when we talk about the budget or Scotland's finances or the revenue or whatever, we often hear prior to any explanation, it's complicated. And part of the job description, essential skills and desirable skills and experience, it talks about communicating, influencing complex information in an accessible language. So how do you propose to do that? What, how, what would be make it easier for non-financial people to understand Scotland's budget? Well, partly it's a question of, first of all, deciding what the most important pieces of information are that you need to convey to people. Because often when you're doing some of these forecasting tasks, you have in the back of your mind masses and masses of detail. But a lot of that may not be centrally relevant to the main message you want to convey to others. So I think that the first important thing is to decide what that key message is and then work out what is the best way of getting that particular message across to somebody. Um, if, if it helps, I could give you one example of where I did that in revenue, but it was not particularly in a forecasting context. But there was a proposal coming up for the way in which we treated offshore people with offshore bank accounts. And there's a proposal to send out a letter to taxpayers saying, if you come forward and confess you have these accounts, then instead of paying the usual penalty of 100%, we will lower the penalty to zero if you confess. Now, when I first saw that information, I went straight up to the person who was in charge of me and said, this isn't going to work because think about what you think the probability of detection would have to be to make it worthwhile confessing and giving up a 100% penalty, you would have to think you had a more than 50% chance of being caught. And at that point, the average probability of being caught by the Inland Revenue was 5%. So I convinced the, the head of Inland Revenue that this was not going to work, just by a very simple arithmetical example. And we changed the whole way we did it and because of the way we changed it, we brought in billions of tax revenue. So it's just a question of deciding what was the message you had to get across, get it across with a simple example, and try to persuade somebody about your case. Okay. Um, yes, I mean, I guess it's what David said. I think, you know, one of the important things when delivering you know, complex messages is you have to make it relevant to the person you're talking I think people have a very high capacity actually for, for taking in something quite complicated if they think it's important to them personally and uh, where, where people sort of switch off quite often is where they think the person speaking is explaining something that they don't really need to understand or they're not you know that they don't find personally useful so I think there's a lot of making sure that the message is, is are as relevant to the to as possible the other thing I find works a lot is is putting everything in context. You know, so an international context of, often helps a lot when explaining things. So you know, um, you know, if you can say you you know your bottom of the list or your top of the list, you know, those those sort of things get people interested about the about the topic. Um, so I think putting things in in some sort of context helps. So that's a very generally, but that's the sort of the, the techniques I would I generally use. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, Patrick. No, good morning. Um, it's a question principally for Professor Breeden, uh, relevant to your experience in the fiscal panel in the fiscal policy panel in Jersey. Uh, if I'm understanding it right, it has a slightly different remit than the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission in that it, it actually advises on tax and spending policy, whereas the Fiscal Commission here obviously does work that informs those policy decisions but doesn't directly comment on, on matters of policy. Is that is that accurate? Um, sort of. I mean, I think you know clearly it's still down to the, the states, the parliament makes the, makes the decisions. Um, but I think we, you know, in, in just we have, have, a, have a broader advisory role. So I don't think we, you know, we don't actually set the policy. We, but we will give advice on areas which probably in in this context the, the, the commissioners wouldn't give advice on, which includes policy. Um, and in particular, it, it involves the use. So the Jersey is in the happy position of having a very large fiscal reserve, and so it's we have a, a big role in you know when that reserve is added to 
taken away. So that's something that, that is specific to, to Jersey. Okay, and, and given that, obviously, in the, in the context and the, the history of Jersey, tax avoidance is such a, a major and controversial issue, I'm wondering how the, the panel or you engage with questions of tax ethics and what you think the relevance of that experience, how that could be brought to bear in relation to the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Well, I mean, in the Jersey case, we don't have any remit over those issues at all. So, I mean, that's so. I mean, our our issue, our, our focus is very much on the sustainability, the same. So, the same issue. So, we, so we're interested in a tax policy that is overall. Um, you know, there are elements of individual tax policies. We, yeah, we we wouldn't get involved in. Um, in terms of the financial. Uh, system in Jersey, I, I, I know of it, and I, but I, we don't have any remit to, um, to advise on, on that. And I don't think we uh, have, yeah, I mean, it, it is up to the, this is a, a political decision of the, of the states in terms of how they, how they run that. I don't think it would be appropriate for us to make comments on, on that. Okay. Um, Willie. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, we've heard at the committee in recent times that uh, often the um, estimates for things like VAT, VAT that will be assigned and attributed to Scotland are going to be done via surveys. Uh, and that, I think, I think, has concerned some members about the accuracy of that. Have you any ideas how we can improve the accuracy of data that, that we actually deal with to try to get closer to exact pictures for things like that, things like VAT or even... Scottish uh, income tax payers and so on. So it seems to be, it seems to be pretty inaccurate. I think there's a fair message. I think that we've heard to date. Well, at, at the UK level, our forecasts of VAT were probably the most accurate forecasts we had. But I can see there is a problem with how you assign some of those revenues to Scotland. Um, most of the stuff on um, forecasting VAT comes from consumer expenditure surveys. And so they, they are kind of inevitably based on surveys because it's very hard to get some direct measures of um, consumer spending. Um, you obviously, you get it through the shops, but um, if you want to know how much of people in Scotland are spending on this, it's very hard to get that other than through a survey. Over time, we might find ways of trying to improve the accuracy of that once we've got a better understanding of the patterns there. Um, we may be able to find ways in which you could identify more accurately spending which is genuinely attributable to people in Scotland. Um, but I think inevitably at the moment we're going to be reduced to using surveys for this. Uh, and, and good surveys can be quite accurate as well. I, I was, as an economist, I was initially quite sceptical of surveys, but I became more of a fan as I I saw the use of them. Yeah, I think I agree. I mean, surveys, it, it, it's all in the <laughs> in the construction. I mean, I think they, it is amazing the power of statistics that, you know, a, a survey for a small number of people can be very informative as long as the survey is very carefully constructed. Um, but also, I would say, you know, as I said before, I think, you know, there is increasing ability to do something cleverer and fancier than that in the future. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, we would want to look at is you know what opportunities there are to use you know new data sources new approaches to all these problems I'm, I'm afraid it's sort of day one for me so I can't say much more than those are you know those sort of ideas I can't I can't give any specifics at this stage I haven't had any other member indicating a wish to ask any other questions so can I thank uh, both of our professors for joining us today uh, the committee will now consider nominations later in our meeting in private and then we'll publish a report setting out our recommendations to Parliament can I thank both of our professors for their attendance before the committee this morning and I will briefly suspend the meeting to allow a changeover of witnesses.
Colleagues, our next piece of business is to take evidence from Mitchum RC as part of our pre-budget <laughs> scrutiny. We're joined for this item by Jim Hara, who's the Director General of the Customer Strategy and Tax Design, and Jackie McGeekin, who's the Deputy Director of Income Tax Policy. I welcome both of our witnesses to the meeting this morning. And members have received copies of the HMRC's annual report. Um, but before we go to questions from the committee, the, the Jim or Jackie, do you want to make an opening statement? Thank you, Convener. I'll just uh, make a few short uh, points. First of all, to confirm to the committee that uh, HMRC has provided the annual report on Scottish income tax to the Scottish Government, as set out in our service level agreement. And this has also been provided to the committee, along with the relevant extract from the department's accounts uh, on Scottish income tax. Um, I also want to draw the committee's attention to the successful delivery of the changes to Scottish income tax for 1918-19 that were announced in last year's budget. Uh, we worked very closely with the Scottish Government at every stage of implementing uh, those powers, including incorporating the 1918-19 uh, changes, and we look forward to uh, delivering on the budget announcement that we expect uh, later this year. Uh, finally, I'd just like to apologise, Convener, that a letter from uh, me to you in the summer went astray somehow. I don't know why, but uh, you should now have a copy of it. So apologies for that. OK. I'm not asking any more about that. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, I think James Kelly would like to begin some of the questions this morning. OK. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning to you. Um, I want to focus on the issue of the income tax outturn for 2016-17. Um, clearly, in terms of your report, that was £550 million less than previous estimates. And the, the part of the reason attributed for that was the movement in uh, additional and uh, um, higher rate taxpayers. Um, so that initial, the initial estimates were based on the survey of personal income and the movement from that resulted in 5,000 additional less additional rate payers and 43,000 less higher rate payers, which contributed to the, the reduction in the outturn uh, from estimate of £550 million. So uh, uh, initially I'm interested just in an explanation of the methodology around the survey of personal income uh, and how that drove the, the, the number of taxpayers and uh, how you arrived at the, the actual outturn figures uh, in the report that you produced. OK, so the, the survey of personal incomes is uh, conducted on a, a sample of uh, taxpayers where we uh, gather the data from tax returns on their uh, incomes. The most recent one was for 2015-16, uh, which is what the 16-17 uh, forecast was based on. Uh, there are some uh, issues uh, with doing that. First of all, uh, the fact that projecting uh, data from a previous year, making assumptions about wage growth and population changes, builds in uncertainty uh, into the forecast. Um, additionally, I think the survey, whilst it's regarded as representative at the UK level, is less accurate at a sub-UK level when you try to break it down by, uh, by country or by region. And we are working with um, ONS and the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Scottish Government about what improvements can be uh, made to that. So that would be, I think, the, uh, a key reason why, as the Scottish Fiscal Commission say, the SPI overestimated the number of higher rate and additional rates Scottish taxpayers which was a significant factor in the uh, inaccuracy in the forecast. Uh, in addition, the, for the 1516 SPI, we did not have the identification of Scottish taxpayers, so we had to uh, try to identify them from that survey just based on uh, postcode information. Uh, when we uh, uh, produced the 1617 SPI, we will actually be able to do that based on the actual identifier of Scottish taxpayers, so that will make it more accurate than the, than the previous one for forecasting uh, purposes. Our, turning to the outturn, that is based on the actual uh, 
inf uh, information from page wearing and self-assessment returns for people who are identified on our database as Scottish uh, taxpayers, uh, and so therefore it is uh, an act sort of much more accurate outturn and based on much more up-to-date uh, data and it has been audited by the National Audit Office as part of their audit of our, our accounts and our trust statement. Okay, I cut just a couple of follow-on points from that. If we then take uh, 1617 as a kind of baseline position, because that's the, the first year where you've we've captured all the, the Scottish taxpayers, how confident are you in the figures that you've captured that that is an accurate baseline? Yes, uh, you know, we are confident that that is an accurate uh, outturn, and as I say, it's been uh, audited uh, independently, um, and it is based on uh, you know, much more up-to-date information. There is a table in our accounts which shows some further adjustments that we've had to make for events that had not yet happened at the point when that outturn got locked down. So, for example, there will be some uh, people who pay late, and we've had to... Uh, look at historical data for payment rates in order to adjust uh, that for non-payment by late payers, for example. But those are really quite marginal uh, adjustments. And so that is, uh, I think, a, a, an accurate outturn and has been independently verified. What is the size of the Scottish sample for SPI and how, what role does that play uh, moving forward for future forecasts? Um, I don't have the information for the size of the, this Scottish input to the SPI. It is a it's a, an ONS owned uh, piece of statistics, but I can certainly get, get you that information. Okay. Uh, I just follow up on that, James, because your, your service level agreement with the Scottish Government requires HMRC to provide the Scottish Government with sufficient, relevant, timely information and data for rates, rate setting and forecasting for the Scottish income tax. And Jim, you said already to uh, James in your answer, there are issues about that. Scottish data, not uh, in, uh, in relation to the the, the, the UK d data, um, and you say in section two of your annual report that although the SPI is considered to be representative at the UK taxpayer population, it's less reliable at sub UK level. Now that gives me some concerns, as you may imagine, given that we're, our process is very much based on forecasting. So, given the significance of income tax forecasting to the size of the Scottish budget, is it reasonable, do you think, that the, that the data you're providing to support the process, um, which your own report describes as less reliable than the sub-UK level? Because, because murder, I think, I think we're all under a, bit, a, 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 a slight misapprehension that the data being looked at, both for the Scottish circumstances and the UK circumstances, were the same. But it's obviously not the same. It's the same information base but it's not the same level of data. Yes, you're right. I mean, it is exactly the same uh, data set, uh, and the Scottish Government and the Scottish Fiscal Commission uh, get the, what is uh, materially identical data to what the OBR get uh, for the UK from, from that set. But you're right that when you drill down into the SPI to look at uh, Scotland only, there, you know, the, there, it is less reliable than it is if you look at a whole UK picture. That is the data that we had from the 15-16 uh, uh, survey. Uh, you know, we are looking with the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Scottish Government and the Office for National Statistics of, for what improvements uh, could be made. But I think the key thing is uh, to get that uh, more up-to-date uh, data and uh, going forward to have data that's based on actual taxpayer, Scottish taxpayer identification are two key steps, I think. OK, but given that there is potential significance for any forecast error for the Scottish budget, um, how, how pressing is the work that's going on for the Scottish Fiscal Commission to have increased access to the data um, on Scottish income tax at the same level as, as it's available at the UK? For example, why have the SAFE only got access to the public user's tape data for the survey of personal incomes? In terms of access to data, the uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission has got exactly the same access to Scotland-level data as the OBR has to UK data, so there's no uh, question of uh, reduced access. The only slight exception to that is at the very top of the income ranges. We've had to do a bit more aggregation uh, at Scotland to avoid identifying individuals. 
uh, but but that is sort of immaterial in terms of the level of data access. It's actually the the sort of quality of the underlying data in the survey that is the issue, rather than a restriction of access. Okay, and I guess, sorry to leave this point, but you can just tell us a bit more about what what's going on to improve the quality of that data then that's available, just so we can understand a bit more clearly. Yes. Yeah, so the um, so the statisticians are working with. Uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission and Scottish Government on how the, the base of the survey uh, could be improved, uh, both to provide more uh, data that gives a more accurate picture for Scotland, but also to give it more timelessly. Uh, we have uh, this year pulled forward the timing of when we produced that data in accordance with our agreement with the Scottish Fiscal Commission to support them, and we, we, we'll be looking to do that again uh, next year. Jim, sorry, James. I'm sorry if I cut across any of the areas you were going into, James. Yeah, just, just one kind of follow-up yeah. point to, to that, convener. It's just this. The, this uh, I, I would reiterate the point that the, the sample size is very important. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sure I read somewhere that it might be as low as two percent, and if that's quite a low sample size, and you're extrapolating from that, it obviously. Uh, adds to the, the potential risk of error. So what, obviously you've got this baseline figure now in terms of the actual outturn figures, and you've got the the SPI uh, survey that is, that is ongoing. How did how do those two interact, you know, to update your forecasts? Okay, so um, now I'm not a statistician, but uh, I know that even what sound like relatively small sample sizes can actually give, as a previous witness mentioned, can give very uh, accurate level, levels of data compared with the full population. Obviously, the larger the sample size, the smaller the error rate, but sometimes as you increase that sample size, that can be a very marginal difference. But we are, you know, that is something I think the statisticians in HMRC, ONS and Scottish Fiscal Commission are, are looking at. Your second point was, how does it how, how does it interact? You've got the, you've got the survey data going mm -hmm. forward, and you've got these baseline numbers on yeah. the outturn report for 16, 17 yeah. on the actual number of taxpayers. So how does that work going forward to yes. update so, forecasts? So the outturn is based on the full set of just over two and a half uh, million uh, taxpayers, and uh, so it's not survey based at all. Uh, you know what that outturn uh, tells you is. Uh, a, it was significantly lower than the forecast for 1617. But now, having a baseline year, if you compare that with the forecast for 1718, for example, they, you know, that uh, assumes a level of growth in uh, Scottish income tax receipts, which, whilst possible, I think is not likely. And therefore, you know, I would expect those who issue forecasts, which is the Scottish Fiscal Commission and OBR to take that into account in the next forecasting uh, round. There were some other issues uh, with that year which I think affected uh, forecasting. So the devolved powers relate to non-savings and non-dividend income. So as well as having to uh, estimate the balance between Scottish and non-Scottish taxpayers, you also have to estimate the balance between uh, savings and dividend income and non-savings and dividend income. And that was a particular challenge in 1617 because the UK Parliament introduced changes to the taxation of dividends in uh, around that time, which caused had behavioural effect on people who control their own companies in terms of the timing of their uh, dividends. And I think you know, one of the uh, lessons I suspect is that when we analyse the outturn for 1617, you will find that the proportion of the total UK income tax receipts that came from dividend income was different from the assumption in the forecast. That will wash itself through uh, in, in f further years. I'm sorry to labour this point, but you, you've, as you said, you've got on the, the outturn data, you've got two and a half million taxpayers now that you've identified and you've got this ongoing survey, which is a sample going forward. How is that then used, for example, to update the 17-18 forecast? How, how is the survey data used to interact with the, the 2.5 million base data set that you've got to update your forecasts? So, I mean, HMRC does not uh, issue the forecasts. That is OBR and Scottish Fiscal uh, Commission. What we do is provide them with the data that we have. Uh, when they made their forecasts uh, last round, they did not have the 16-17 uh, outturn data. Uh, 
uh, next round they have that plus some further data around economic determinants, which may well change their, their forecast, but it is for them to produce the forecasts with the data that we have available. Okay. I think one has got the next supplementary to that. Thanks, James. Yes, th thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Harrow. Just, just, I just want clarity around the issue of the number of Scottish taxpayers in uh, Table 2 on Section 2 of your annual report. You have a figure for all Scottish taxpayers, 2.528 million. Does that include everyone who has an S code, or is that only people actually paying tax? In other words, I'm trying to capture you know, the people who um, are earning but below the personal allowance level. No, these are only people who are paying tax. Right. Uh, there is a larger number of people who would potentially be Scottish taxpayers if, they're, if they had income, non-savings, non-dividend income uh, within the taxable range. Yeah, and do we have a figure f for, for that larger number? Do you have a figure for that? I'm afraid I don't. We'll we let you have that, that figure. Yeah. That would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Willie, am I right? You had a, a question in this area as well. Am I right? Yeah, that, Bruce, many thanks. Uh, good morning, Jim. Jackie, uh, I wonder if I could refer you to Table 1 in your report, uh, and that, which shows the, the outturn figures. And, I'm interested in the, the breakdown between the Scottish figure and the rest of the UK figure, Jim. Mm -hmm. If you look at the self-assessed uh, tally total there at 79.76 for the RUK and 4.36 for Scotland, that, that represents about 5.4% of the share for Scotland, which seems a wee bit on the low side to me. And if you look at the next line, the PAYE, columns, the Scottish share of that RUK is about 9%. I was just wondering if there's a wee bit of narrative behind that and why why would the Scottish share of that, and these are actual figures, remember, these aren't forecasts, why would the Scottish share be so low in my view compared to what perhaps the population share might be, which would be around 9%? I mean, that, that will be because of just differences in the profile of Scottish and rest of the UK taxpayers in terms of their sources and levels of income. Uh, who is in self-assessment is not a, uh, a sort of, it's not a legislative test that puts you into self-assessment. You are in self-assessment if, if HMRC feel that that is necessary in order to administer your tax affairs. Uh, and I think, you know, it will be down to the profile of uh, taxpayers in Scotland compared with taxpayers in the rest of the UK, how many of them are in self self assessment. So the, that balance will be different, really, for partly because of the uh, profiles of employment versus uh, self employment and other income, but also income levels, because um, uh, you know that is one of the determinants about whether we feel we need to put someone in self assessment. Mm -hmm. you, you note that in your footnote there, just below the table, it also says that the first line actually includes an element of PAYE. So that first line figure may, in fact, be even smaller if that were not. Yes, so, uh, I mean, for example, I'm an employee of uh, HMRC, but I'm also in self-assessment. So when I complete my self-assessment return, I put my employment income onto my return. So, uh, you know, in this table, that would have come out in the in the SA figure rather than in the pay as you earn figure. So the pay as you earn figure <coughs> is really for people who are uh, who, who are only in pay as you earn and, and don't have you know, don't have to complete a self-assessment return. But if you do have to complete a self-assessment return, then your employment income and the tax on it is reflected in the SA line. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're happy that it's completely accurate because it seems such a quite a discrepancy between the two, you know, between I mean, Scotland and our UK. If you like, I mean, we can difference. we can go away and get you some proper analysis of what we think. I mean, I've described what I believe the reasons yeah. for that are. Uh, we'll see if we can get, actually get some analysis to back up what I've what I've told you. But. Um, you know, these are two ways of administering tax as opposed to uh, two different sets of tax liabilities. And, you know, as you've mentioned, for example, people who are in pay as you earn are also in self-assessment, so they're, they're in a different line. But we can, we can try and get you some more analysis that explains that. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Alex, I think you were interested in issues of consolidation. Yeah, um, yeah it's st still on the, the theme of the reconciliation and the, and the th around the three-year time lag uh, and the issues with it. I just wonder what your views are in, in terms of having an interim uh, or what, what can be done to have some sort of interim reconciliation. Um, I see in your report that you, you, you mentioned that there's an intention for HMRC to publish uh, um, real-time figures, which would obviously uh, in, uh, improve uh, that ability. Um, that's, that's the first question. But the second bit is around, um, it, you know, we, it talks about th this data, it can just clarify, is this just PAYE data, 
rather than self-assessment data, um, in which case would that be then more accurate for Scotland because we have a higher percentage of PAYE uh, uh, taxpayers. And then lastly, uh, um, for the self-assessment bit, in, in, is there any uh, possibility of publishing that? Yeah, and I appreciate that the, the profile of that payment during the year will, will vary, which is maybe why it's not done. But you, you, you said, you mentioned that you look at the historical data for payment rates around what's paid late to give you a profile. Is there a possibility of actually that being improved on so that you can have uh, interim data around self-assessment? Yes. So a couple of years ago, <coughs> we uh, introduced a new IT system uh, and method of uh, for pay you earn and method of collecting uh, payroll data, which means that called real time information, which means that for pay you earn, we now have uh, in year data which we did, which we gather from employers which we did not previously have. Uh, that is. Uh, uh, supplied by employers every time they run their payroll, so it's generally monthly, but it can actually be more frequently uh, than that. And we have shared that data with uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Scottish Government uh, to uh, support the in-year uh, forecasting. There are a couple of uh, issues with that. First of all, uh, as you say, it doesn't include self-employed income, which is about 16, 17% of uh, the, uh, the income that you're interested in. Also, Within our pay as you earn codes, we do sometimes adjust for things that are not relevant to the Scottish income tax. So, for example, if someone has savings income, we may adjust their pay as you earn uh, code to collect that. Uh, so, it's not so the amount of uh, tax that's being deducted as you go along through pay as you earn is not always precisely the same as what the eventual Scottish income tax outturn will be. Uh, I said a couple, but a third one is that that is based on uh, the uh, S code each month. Uh, however, Scottish taxpayers are not, the, the test for being a Scottish taxpayer is not a monthly test, it's an annual test. So it is possible that we would deduct tax from someone on the basis that they're a Scottish taxpayer in April, May and June. Then they would move, say, south of the border and actually for that tax year they will turn out not to be a Scottish taxpayer and therefore uh, those first three months of collection would come out in the outturn or vice versa. So those are some <coughs> issues with the sort of quality of the, the data that the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Scottish Government need to take account of. But nevertheless, we think it, it will give a very useful source of data for, uh, for in-year forecasting. As far as the self-employed are concerned, we do not have any in-year data. They, uh, c they give us their income data on their self-assessment return by the 31st of January after the end of the tax year. So there's quite a lag in uh, collecting that. Potentially in the future, we will get more in-year data from the self-employed. So we have a, uh, a, a, a new policy that we're rolling out called Making Tax Digital for Businesses, which involves receiving quarterly updates of data from the self-employed. Uh, that launches next April for VAT, but there's already a pilot out there that enables people to do that for income tax purposes as well. So in the future, it may well be that we will get in-year data on the self-employed, but currently we do not have any. So, so just to summarise that, would you say that you're, you said you, um, you, you can get basically 80% accuracy in real time? Yes, so the, the, the real time information data that we give uh, based on pay as you earn will cover about 83 to 84% of the total, the total income that's within the Scottish income tax, but subject to those, uh, those issues with the data that I mentioned. Um, I think you were interested in this area as well, am I right? Yeah, I think it's largely covered, but if, it's, if your permission can be just a very brief supplementary to some of the points that uh, Mr Kelly was raising. Um, with reference to the provisional estimate of revenue for 2017-18, 11.9 billion, if I'm correct, how provisional is that estimate? Uh, I mean, that, that, I think, was the uh, OBR uh, forecast in March. Uh, we did our own uh, forecast that goes into our trust statement uses a little bit more up-to-date data because it was done slightly later in the year but not materially uh, different. Uh, however, you know, as I said, when now that we have got the outturn data for 2016-17, which was not available when that forecast was uh, made, uh, you can see that that forecast assumes a level of growth in Scottish income tax between 16-17 and 17-18, which, whilst not impossible, I think is unlikely. So I I would expect that in the next round of forecasts that might come down. Thank you for that clarification. Am I right you had some issues on data as well, correct? 
simply about um, identifying all the Scottish tax, um, I guess, taxpayers. So, are you confident that all the Scottish rate taxpayers have been fully captured and that the 2016-17 outturn data is accurate and it's a current reflection on reality? Because you spoke about people who might spend the first three months north of the border and then move south, and that would add ad additional I guess, complexity in it all. I'll let Jackie. So I think we are confident that 98 to 99% we have captured Scottish uh, taxpayers in our, our data. Um, it's, there is no definitive list of Scottish taxpayers. Obviously, that population moves around a little bit. Um, people come in and out of it for various reasons. So we, but we've done, we, each year we carry out a big data ma matching exercise to identify and improve our data on Scottish taxpayers. It starts from ma a data clash between we're using all of our UK records against third-party data to corroborate the, the details of, of tax of individuals. So that, that we started with 78, about 48, 47 million records matched by name, national insurance number, and so on. And in that group, only around about 5,000 were identified as having a third-party Scottish address um, and with our records, a UK address. And then around 4,000 had a third-party UK address and our record shared a Scottish address. So pretty good, good, good matching record. And we wrote then to all of those where there was some doubt over which address was correct. We had quite a good return with response to those letters. So around about a third, more than a third of people responded, which is, is a high rate for, for something that they don't really feel they need to do. And in most cases, they confirmed that the HMRC address was correct or they told us what the correct address was and we updated our records. Then we looked at the unmatched records and the Scottish unmatched records, something like 1.1 million. We took out duplicates, we took out those who were, had moved abroad, we looked at, um, and then we took out some who were temporary reference numbers, for example. So um, if someone uh, takes on a new employee and they don't have all the information about them, a temporary reference number might be allocated in the tax system and it's not accurate as to which, where the person is actually living. Um, and we took out the records of those where there's no activity, uh, no tax activity in the last five years. So we whittled down that, that population. Um, after removing all of those groups, we got to about 490,000 we needed to, to do more work to corroborate. Um, we looked then at where those, if they were employed, where, the, where their employer was. Did they have a Scottish employer with the pay, pay as you earn record is with a Scottish employer? And uh, about 280,000 had a Scottish employer, um, leaving 208,000 uncorroborated. But within that number, uh, some of them... Some of those individuals will be in Scotland. They will be uh, in SA, but we don't. We haven't been able to check the, the address yet. Or they will be employed by some uh, a, a employer who is based across the UK. So a large employer with with, with employees across the whole of the UK. We wouldn't be able to see that from from the payers' own record that someone was was with, that the employer was Scottish. So essentially, we get down to something over 96% corroboration, firm corroboration, plus an assumption that within the remaining small number, some of those will also be Scottish. So 98 to 99%. And then we repeat this exercise every year. Keep our, And then the, the other part of this, it's very important, we you want to touch on it later, is, is the, the communication around asking people to tell us if they, if they do move. Um, most people do without any prompting, but we just keep reinforcing that message that they need to tell us if they've moved address. So it's a long process, sorry for all the detail, but we, we do a lot of work to, to check the addresses. Okay, thank you. The detail helps, actually. Thank you. Detail that work's going on, because there was obviously some questions raised at the beginning of this process. So, um, I guess that leads into your area, Murdoons. Yes, yeah. th th thank you. It follows on um, uh, quite nicely. I was going to ask about, about some of the compliance issues, and your address is also in your annual uh, report um, in relation to potential behaviour changes around uh, tax changes. Uh, that are made, um, and you talk about potential um, cross-border migration, which, in, in, in light of the, the level of tax changes, probably is unlikely, but what maybe is more likely is people, um, high net worth individuals, shifting income uh, towards dividend payments. Is that something that you're giving a close eye on, and how are you monitoring that aspect? Do you want me to pick up? Um, so, yes, yeah, so clearly, 
uh, where there's a differential in uh, tax rates that creates incentives, uh, the uh, risk that people will change their behaviour in response to those uh, incentives really depends on the on the scale of the differential, uh, on the scale of effort involved in uh, changing their behaviour and in what the compliance rules around that are, and as you heard from a previous uh, witness, and what the chances are of being caught uh, if, you, if you break the rules. Um, in the case of uh, Scottish income tax, if you assume that Scottish income tax is higher than uh, the UK, which is the case for higher uh, earners, then the incentives are that you disguise your identity as a Scottish taxpayer and you pretend not to be a Scottish taxpayer, and Jackie's described the, the work that we do to uh, validate that, or that you uh, avoid or evade the tax on your income by either under-declaring it or, as you say, changing its nature into a non-savings, uh, from non-savings, non-dividend. There are when it comes to incorporation and changing your income into dividends, some people have got the scope to do that, and there are limited rules that prevent you from doing it. Uh, in the case of people who would, uh, who, whose working relationship is employment, there are quite strong rules that prevent them from shifting that employment income into uh, incorporation and dividend income. But for people who are self-employed, there are no rules to stop them incorporating their business and then uh, drawing out income by way of dividend. Uh, and tax-motivated incorporation is an issue uh, in the whole of the UK tax system as well as in the Scottish tax system because uh, even in the rest of the UK the differential between corporate tax rates and uh, income tax rates is there and creates an incentive. On the other hand, the dividend taxation changes that I mentioned earlier that came in uh, a couple of years ago actually um, reduce the incentive to incorporate to some extent because uh, Basically, it has increased the level of taxation on dividend uh, income. So it is a behavioural response that is entirely possible. And I think the Scottish Fiscal Commission has made an estimate of what impact that will have on Scottish income tax uh, receipts. But for self-employed people, there are no rules to stop you incorporating. But you will be monitoring on an ongoing basis, I assume, whether there is a, a trend in that direction. You'll be able to identify that, will you? We... Uh, as a sort of administrative and compliance organisation, uh, in relation to the self-employed, don't have a direct interest in it because it's not non-compliant uh, behaviour. It's something they're, they're quite at liberty to do. However, clearly policymakers and forecasters have an interest in it, and therefore we do supply data that enables them to assess that. A couple of years ago, the OBR did quite a bit of work on the level of tax-motivated incorporation uh, across the UK and its impact on receipts. And then I know that in the last forecast, uh, the Scottish Fiscal Com uh, Commission made its own estimate of the impact on Scottish income tax receipts, which is, I think, between five and £30 million pounds a year. OK, so you, you, you collect the data, but ultimately it will be the Fiscal Commission who will express a view Yes, and, on, and, on this. Yeah. and policymakers who, who keep yeah. an eye on it as well. So, I mean, the dividend taxation changes that came in a couple of years ago were in part uh, uh, a recognition of the fact that as corporation tax rates come down, the incentive to incorporate grows, and that counteracted that uh, to some extent. OK, thank you. Uh, that's, that's very useful, because obviously if there are some suggestions there might be a reduction in corporation tax as part of the... And I'm making assumptions here, and for, based on what I see in the media, the Chancellor may reduce corporation tax in his budget, and obviously that would potentially have a significant impact, or, or some impact, on the amount of income tax then paid in Scotland, which obviously supports the public services in Scotland. How soon can you pick up from your information that you have about what impact that's having? Because obviously you might expect we would be concerned if the the amount of income tax taken in Scotland was reduced as a result of a, a lever for, for legitimate reasons being used at another place. So, uh, first of all, the, the UK government has actually set out its roadmap for corporation tax rates over the next couple of years, uh, going down to 17%, and that has already been factored into the forecasts. Uh, you are right that it is within their, uh, their power to change that roadmap, um, but uh, and, and then you would have to revise the forecasts accordingly. But at the moment, the forecasts already have baked into them uh, an assumption about where corporate tax rates are going based on, on the roadmap that the British government has uh, announced. Um, it, I mean, how quickly can we... So I think when the 
uh, if a new corporate rate uh, tax rate was announced, then the economists will forecast what the behavioural effect of that will be, and the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the UBR will turn that into the, their forecast of the impact of uh, tax motivated in corporations. Over time, you would then have to track whether the behaviour matched the forecast, and it would take some time for that uh, to come through. People, you know, would not go out the next day after an announcement and set up their company. You know, it'll probably be the next time they see their accountant. Their accountant will say, "Have you thought about?" And it, so it happens over a period of time. Uh, so it is something that we can track in terms of the growth of uh, company registrations and the, and the growth of the corporate tax base. Uh, so, but it takes time. It takes time to monitor. You must. So, you must have some historical data on this then, in terms of the the shift there's been from paying income tax to corporate corporation tax, and at this stage, it'll be across the UK. We do, and the OBR published quite a comprehensive uh, report on that. I think in 2016, which I'll, I'll happily send a, co a copy to the committee. I, I guess the question for me though is. Would, would the Scottish Fiscal Commission be able to get a data set for Scotland that would tell them what was happening in Scotland specifically that would be accurate enough for them to make forecasts as well? Um, I mean, I know the Scottish Fiscal Commission have made a forecast. The, uh, I'd need to check what data we can actually pro provide as opposed to what assumptions they will have to make and then test later on. I will, I'll check that. It would be useful just to, to know that. Thank mm -hmm. you, Jim. Angela, I think you had issues on transparency. Yes, thank you, convener. Um, good morning. Given that uh, anything to do with the fiscal framework um, is somewhat uh, complex uh, and we'd like uh, more people to engage with it and understand it, I've just got a few quick questions around um, transparency. Um, there's been instances in the past where fairly fundamental uh, information has been buried away in technical annexes and then you know, the more fulsome information has, has come out in, in dribs and drabs. And I suppose that the instance uh, that I'm referring to is the 16-17 global figure, uh, the 10.7 billion figure for the Scottish receipts um, that was buried away uh, in, in, in an annex, and then you know Mr. Hara, um, you know, wrote to committee and uh, you know supplied uh, further information. So what I'm interested in is that uh, looking ahead. Uh, will you firstly publish the 2017-18 non-savings, non-dividend Scottish income tax outturn figures? Uh, how will you do that in a publicly um, accessible uh, manner? And will you discuss with stakeholders, whether that's this committee, uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission, Scottish Government, um, about the timing of that information, how it's best uh, put uh, in context and uh, the, the, the method by which it's communicated. Okay, so we um, we have a commitment under our uh, service level agreement with the Scottish Government to produce the annual report. I'm quite happy to, uh, uh, you know, discuss with people the format of that and how um, it is, uh, you know, made more accessible to people. Uh, the purpose of that report, I think, was to make sure that the extracts which are, uh, you know, in there in quite a voluminous set of HMRC accounts and trust statement actually are taken out and, and can be, uh, you know, made more accessible. But I'm quite happy to look at what, uh, what more work can be done on that. In terms of timing, we, um, you know, this is part of our overall accounts and uh, trust statement, uh, which uh, gets published around June uh, time each year, which is as quickly as we can possibly make it after the end, the 31st March end of the financial year. We have pulled that forward uh, in recent years, and we continue to try and do it as soon as we can. But actually, you know, given the scale of what we have to produce, I think there's there's limited scope to bring it in much earlier than it currently is. However, this year, the uh, as well as the figure for the Scottish income tax, there was also an interest in the. Uh, figure for the rest of the UK, uh, which we did not produce at the same time. We actually produced that, uh, I think, a, couple, you know, about a few weeks later. And certainly for next year, we will be aiming to produce that at exactly the, at the same time, so that there will be a comprehensive uh, set. We are also working with the Scottish Fiscal Commission on uh, what further st you know, official statistics uh, we can publish around that time on uh, Scottish income tax. So, for example, that RTI data that I mentioned earlier that we provide monthly to the Scottish Government and uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission. I know there's been a, a, 
a fiscal framework recommendation that that be published every month and that would be our intention. Uh, we are just working through some of those data issues I described that are not relevant to Scottish income tax but make that uh, data um, sort of less than perfect to make sure that when we do publish it monthly that we're able to describe that in an effective way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that fulsome answer. Thanks, Convener. Okay, can I thank our witnesses very much for their contribution this morning? It was very useful information you provided, Jim, Jim and Jackie. I'm very grateful to you. And I now suspend this meeting till a changeover of witnesses. Okay, our next piece of business is to continue our pre-budget scrutiny by taking evidence from the Cabinet Secretary of Finance, Economy and Fair Work. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary is accompanied today by Scottish Government officials, Eden Greaswood, who is the Deputy Director of Tax, Daniel Hines, who is the Deputy Director of Fiscal Sustainability. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting. Members have received copies of the Scottish Government's Fiscal Outturn Report, which will help inform today's Evidence session, uh, evidence session and deliberations. But before we go to questions from the committee, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he any, wants to make a, an opening statement? Just ever so briefly, yep, thank please. you, Convener. Just to say that following from the uh, Budget Process Review Group, this report, of course, was requested. We've tried to make it as, as comprehensive as possible. But, of course, there's another first uh, arriving from the new arrangements 
We're very happy to take further suggestions to see how we can progress this report in any other uh, workings and understanding uh, of the, uh, the outturn. But I certainly welcome the publication of the report engagement in it, as it covers issues around reconciliation and, and the issues in relation to the fiscal framework and transfer of powers, recognising you took uh, evidence from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury last week, and I met her just the day before her evidence session as well. So happy to take any questions on, on the report. Okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. So, some things I just want to get on the record. So can the Cabinet Secretary explain what effect the lower than forecast income tax revenues for 2016 will have on the Scottish budget, both for 2016-17 and 17-18? This essentially was the issue about the earlier estimates that were survey-based uh, on income tax, and then as we move closer to outturn, we have more exact numbers coming from HMRC and then what the SFC uses. In short, there is no impact on the Scottish budget as a consequence of that particular issue. Uh, that said, in understanding the absolute detail of the composition of the Scottish tax base, all decision makers have to be mindful of what that composition of the tax base looks like going forward in policy, but there is no impact on the budget coming from that particular statistical issue, to be clear. Okay. Uh, given that the, the <coughs> there are implications, though, in t from it in terms of the lower numbers of additional rate and higher rate taxpayers, which were estimated going forward. So what impact going forward do you think that will have in terms of your, your policy? So, of course, the numbers that we can draw down from Treasury, the numbers we understand it will raise in tax from any tax policies changes we make, cognizant of all the complexities of the fiscal framework, but fundamentally we have a clearer understanding of how many additional rate and higher rate taxpayers that we have. So that will inform decisions going forward. And decisions are not just the government takes, but all parties in Parliament would take and how they arrive at any budget position or, or policy they have on tax rates um, emerge going forward. Um, but because that was the baselining issue, it has no, uh, as I say, no budget impact, but in policy terms going forward, you would certainly want to be mindful of that. And I think James had some supplementaries in that area. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning. I have a, a follow on to that. So, um, from the budget, the 2018 19 budget that was agreed by Parliament in February, uh, when the Fiscal Commission later in the year looked at the income tax position, they downgraded the income tax forecast by two hundred and eight million. In addition to that, as you've noted yourself and we've heard earlier from HMRC, there are five thousand less additional taxpayers and forty three thousand less higher taxpayers. So if the the forecast in the current budget, the income tax forecast in the current budget has been downgraded and it stands to reason that there are less uh, income taxpayers, that's going to mean public spending cuts, isn't it? I think we have to, budget. but convener, I'm trying to be really clear and helpful with the committee. There are separate issues here, and we're taking different points of time and different bits of the process. The early baselining <coughs> issues was was the issue that you asked me about, convener, which has no budgetary impact because we reconcile the numbers and we arrive at a main baseline issue to which the UK government and Scottish government work. For that reason, there's no impact on the budget. I, I understand that some members you know, may have misunderstood what that means for the Scottish budget. There is no half a billion pound hit on the Scottish budget. As the Fiscal Commission has more data, more outturn figures, clearly the numbers that we're working with um, are, are, are advanced. That baseline point has been addressed. Can, can I come to the more recent, though, because there is a fair point in forecasts. The, the closer we get to the fiscal events, the better, because then we arrive at actual outturn numbers and clearer estimates. Even the Fiscal Commission's most latest forecast for the medium-term financial strategy, so even that most recent SFC um, forecast is also subject to change. For example, the GDP stats are different to what the Fiscal Commission had estimated in our favour, in Scotland's favour. So what that will mean, taken in isolation already, the forecast that they have around what might be raised around income tax, just taking the GDP element in isolation, will enhance the position as reported by the Fiscal Commission. So I respect it as complex and it's dynamic. Um, but when we get to the budget, the Scottish budget will have the numbers from OBR and will have the latest forecast from the SFC, and it will be informed by, by more up-to-date um, data. So I think all of that's helpful. Again, back to your original point, Convener, we now know that we have fewer 
additional rate and higher rate taxpayers than was thought in earlier years. That has all been addressed in the baselining issue, but policymakers should think about that in determining their propositions going forward into future years. I, 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 that's about as clear, I think, as I can be on, on that matter. Surely, therefore, if you have less uh, taxpayers going forward and therefore less uh, revenue coming through, particularly at these higher rates, then when you set your budget for 1920, you're going to have less in that tax envelope, and that's going to feed through to cuts in public services. No convener. That's the policy. That's, well, well, that's well, the policy well, well, outcome. Well, well, okay. If you if you maintain <laughs> your tax at the level that it's at currently, Con convener. You know, I, I'm trying to be as helpful as possible. But if we understand the fullest possible workings of the fiscal framework, the block grant adjustment, and all the elements that go along with it, it isn't actually as simple as that. What we do is relative to what the UK government's doing in their tax policy. And I'm trying to describe where we are in the composition of the tax base. Now, if I had adopted, for talking sake, convener, to help Mr Kelly, the proposition that was put to me by the Labour Party at last year's budget, yes, I would have been more heavily relying upon additional rate and higher rate taxpayers. So, yes, the composition of the tax base is really important in arriving at the tax decisions you take, but it's driven by the Scottish Fiscal Commission, of course, forecast and understanding of our policy. I understand the point. If we have fewer taxpayers in a particular category, a marginal rate of tax, then that has implications for the outcome. But the historic issues have been redressed because it was about the baselining to which um, we were all um, working. And, of course, the starting position of the Scottish budget is the block grant. All the other adjust adjustments then come after that. So, I mean, I hope that's more helpful. Final question, convener. What's your view then, and what's going to be your approach to, to tax going forward? Bearing in mind these challenges, some of which you've outlined, what's your view on tax policy? Are you are you minded to, uh, to keep it at the same level, or are you looking at any changes? I know this is pre-budget scrutiny, but that's somewhat bold, convener, to ask me what my tax plans are in advance of the Chancellor outlining his tax plans. It's a very fair question, and it's a nice attempt for, for me to um, reveal the, the tax position going forward. That really would be bringing pre-budget scrutiny to a whole new um, level, uh, convener. I, I think the committee is very well cited on the process that I have to under undertake, uh, the position of the, the UK budget. That's a huge fiscal event. That, that impacts on the, uh, the block grant. Uh, the block grant adjustment, as, as understood by the OBR uh, SFC forecast, and then I'll work my way through all of that before I present to Parliament what our tax plans are. Just again for the, for the record, Cabinet Secretary, the baseline is now being established. Cause we just confirm then, it's from here on, it's the relative rates of growth rates uh, from the baseline that will be the important issue, not the information that's already gone past. That, and that's the correct. Stuff. Yes. So that's what actually matters. Yeah, it's the divergence that's, that's the issue, yes, not the starting baseline point, yeah. Adam. Thank you, Convener, and thank you for those answers, Cabinet Secretary, which I think were, were, were very clear. I want to move um, on to the issue of borrowing, which is dealt with in Chapter 5 of your report, and I hope your answers will be just as clear um, here as they were um, uh, earlier um, this morning. You, you say in your report that in total the Scottish Government, I'm talking about capital borrowing in particular, Cabinet Secretary, in total the Scottish Government will have accumulated 1.459 million of capital debt by the end of 2018-19, which you say is, and I quote, well within your overall £3 billion limit. And that's true. It's also true, uh, as you report later on in the chapter, that the Scottish Fis Fiscal Commission has judged these levels of borrowing as being compliant within the terms set out in the fiscal framework and also as reasonable. Um, but isn't it um, also the case, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that um, if you continue with that level of capital borrowing for the next few years, and you haven't said, of course, what, whether you propose to do that or not, that if you continue to draw down your maximum annual allocation each year and continue and also continue to borrow on the basis of relatively long terms, such as 25 years, that you will likely run up against your borrowing limit by 2022? That analysis is correct. And is that what the Scottish Government proposes to do? That is not my proposition. Could, would the Cabinet Secretary like to say any more about what his proposition is likely to be? Well, I said, I know that uh, Mr Tompkins asked for clear and concise answers, so that was clear and concise. I can now go into to greater um, detail. I think, th I think that uh, 
uh, proposition, if I do draw down at that level, then, then that's right. Of course, we hit the um, cap. Uh, I was able to outline some of this in the medium-term financial strategy. I haven't set out the longer-term capital um, plans. In the programme for government announced by the First Minister, there was an indication that we want a national infrastructure mission. I think we all support in this committee the investment in the infrastructure that we'll invest in today, help support our economy and prepare us for the future as well. So I think the Parliament, as well as the government, will have choices to make about how we invest in our infrastructure and how we fund that as well. So I think it can be a mix of investment in our infrastructure that can achieve our infrastructure needs as a country. But, of course, we use our capital borrowing powers as well as our resource borrowing powers. But our capital borrowing powers in relation to this question um, responsibly. Um, and if the Chancellor, and I'm not much clearer on this, if there's a comprehensive spending review in spring next year, then that might give us the ability to set out further multi-year budgets in terms of capital. Um, resource budgets, of course, been one year, so has capital. But I think it would be helpful for everyone if you were able to set out multi-year capital budgets. So I think I'll be able to give more detail, hopefully, at the Scottish Budget and beyond. But some of that is um, contingent upon a, a multi-year settlement from the UK government to understand what capital that, that we have. But we will want to use the capital borrowing powers wisely in a way that gives stability, stimulates the, the economy. But there can be a mix. It doesn't to invest in capital, uh, to invest in infrastructure rather, it doesn't necessarily just have to be that capital borrowing powers that used. There are other levers that can be used. Okay. So I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The, um, uh, I mean, the, the Cabinet Secretary, you're, you're clearly right that some significant choices confront both you as a government and I think us as a parliament. Um, uh, uh, you've indicated that you don't want to run up against that three billion pound cap by 2022, which indicates that, you, that in future years um, your priorities with regard to capital borrowing are going to be different from the priorities that they've been in the last two or three years, where you know we are on that trajectory at the moment. So I, I'm not asking you to give details as to what it is that you're going to be proposing in the budget, but can you um, enlighten us a bit about the, the structure and nature of your thinking about the kinds of factors that you will take into account when deciding when and how to change course from the current, from the current trajectory? I, I wouldn't describe it as, as changing course as such, because I'd, I, I was clear in the medium term if financial strategy for a further period of what borrowing powers should be used. I'm, I'm genuinely reflecting on the, the point that we all want to continue with the infrastructure investment. There are huge capital uh, demands, huge call on resources, but there's a mix of levers that can be used to fund infrastructure uh, investment. And again, in this uh, pre-budget scrutiny, I'm being clear with you, we've, we've used the uh, borrowing powers um, as outlined to stimulate and support our economy. Um, I hope to set out um, longer-term plans on capital. I've done it on a, uh, some substantial commitments, say, for early years to local government on a childcare commitment or on housing investment, re re resource planning assumptions, or in digital. There's a £600 million commitment on digital. But how that's funded is absolutely something I'll be transparent about and return to Parliament on over the course of the budget. But... What I've been clear on is we want to use the borrowing powers responsibly and, of course, we um, return to the review of the fiscal framework and engagement with the UK government on uh, what our uh, arrangements are, what our limits are, what our borrowing powers are, and every other part of the fiscal framework is part of that review leading to 2021. But I'm trying to reassure Mr Tompkins that I'm looking at the range of levers that can be used to invest in infrastructure but use our borrowing powers responsibly. I mean, I mean, that's helpful to a degree, but I mean, in order for the Parliament to engage in effective pre-budget scrutiny, I, I, I do think we could get a little bit, I, think, I do think it would be helpful if we could get a little bit below the top line. We know that there are a range of levers, we know that there are a range of financial devices, we know that capital borrowing isn't the, isn't the only tool that you have in, in your toolbox, but you haven't, been ready, you haven't been any more specific today with respect than you were last time we talked about this a few weeks ago in terms of, you know, how you propose um, to use that different range of levers that you have available to you. And in order for us to be able to do our job effectively in terms of pre-budget scrutiny, I think it would be useful, if not this year, then in future years, for us to get a bit below um, that, that, that top line. But there is one outstanding top line question, which is, that, um, which is this. Um, 
do, do you anticipate that in, when it comes to the fiscal framework review, you will be asking the UK government to raise that cap um, above three billion? It's a premature question, but I would always, as a Scottish Finance Secretary, as any Finance Secretary would, um, want as much flexibility as possible. Now, there's prudent limits that we have self-imposed in terms of um, our, um, for, uh, for example, resource spending as part of actual uh, budget, the 5% self-imposed um, rule. So we'll always act prudently, but the borrowing limits for the Scottish Government are set in that agreement. So, no, it's a premature question um, to say what I'll be asking from the UK Government in those discussions. Incidentally, I would want to revert to the committee first um, to get the committee's view on how we should engage with the UK Government in that, in that review as well. So I'm sure you would want to be part uh, of that engagement process as we review the fiscal framework and the written agreement. Um, but, you know, naturally, I'm a Scottish nationalist. I want Scottish independence. I want as much a normality as any other country in the world in terms of the borrowing arrangements that we can uh, deploy. Um, but what I have at the moment is an agreement with uh, the UK government, and of course we'll return to that at some point in time. I understand Mr Tompkins' desire for more detail around the capital budget going forward. I understand that. But for me to present that, the budget is the most appropriate time to do that. But when that's the point, I outline my... Uh, plans therein, but I was able to cover some of the parameters within which we're working in the medium-term financial strategy. And in this paper, in terms of the borrowing uh, pages that Mr Tompkins has referred to, outlined some more of the detail uh, beneath the headline um, commitment. Now, I know Mr Tompkins wants more on, on what the future like, looks like, but I can really only return to that comprehensively at the next big fiscal event. The major shift since the last time I was before committee was the National Infrastructure Mission, where we outlined that commitment to lever in more finance to take our infrastructure investment to internationally competitive levels. And that will require as I say, a, a range of financial tools to be able to deliver that. And of course, that has to be transparent. Emma, I think we've probably got to the area of your question a bit sooner than I expected. So rather than come back to it later on and come back to the subject, do you want to ask your question now? Sure. Thank okay. you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Adam Tompkins has just talked about um, repayment of borrowing and, uh, and uh, resource uh, repayment. So capital borrowing is over 10 years, repayment and repayment of resources is three to five years. So I'm interested in whether you think it's reasonable that we should be required to balance the budget annually despite the increase in dependence on tax revenue forecasts to determine an annual spending limit. Would it not make more sense because the way that the budget uh, spending repayments is over three to five years or ten years, would it not make more sense to have some the same flexibility as other governments to balance the books over a longer period of time so that maybe the introduction of statutory fiscal rules could be applied? Yeah, I suppose that partly uh, touches upon the, the point that I was just making, Convener, to be fair, that you know, as a devolved administration, we're working within the, uh, the framework. Yes, the, the arrangements we've signed up to, but sometimes it does feel as if we're working in a somewhat constrained fashion. I mean, some fiscal rules we've imposed on ourselves to show good governance and that fiscal restraint, the 5% rule. Uh, around um, resource spending on capital, for example, and then we're well within our borrowing limits. So I think we're showing a, a, a prudent approach. But yeah, independent governments around the world can 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 um, enhance say, their borrowing and, and should do it in a in a in a in a, in a prudent and a fiscally responsible way. Uh, the UK government right now, of course, have a degree of fiscal headroom. It's up to the UK government uh, how they choose to use that. We've made points on about they should use that to, to turn the tap on in terms of um, um, spending, and that would help stimulate the economy, support our public services, and of course, devolved administrations would be um, part of that um, as well. So, yes, I would appreciate more flexibility, but that said, I'm working within the arrangements that we have uh, agreed and I'm trying to get on with. Okay, okay thank you. To me, I was trying to follow a, a, a particular route earlier, but it's inevitably this is going into. into slightly different route than I expected. I'm going to try and keep the flow going and then Tom and then Patrick, because I think it's all playing into the same area now. Thank you, Convener. It's a supplementary to Emma's question, and it's regards with to, to flexibility. The fiscal framework was a product of the pre-Brexit era. 
And we're, it's, as things stand at the moment, it seems as if we are heading towards a hard Brexit, which um, Sir Anton Muscatelli described as representing the most unhinged example of national self-sabotage in living memory. Cabinet Secretary, do you believe that there's enough flexibility within the fiscal framework to contend with these particular shocks and damaging effects that a hard Brexit could have in Scotland, given that, for example, <coughs> Fraser of Allender are estimated between 30 and 80,000 job losses, and in the case of a no-deal Brexit, the Government of the Bank of England estimated that house prices could fall by up to a third? Uh, Kandina, that's, that's an excellent question. No, I don't think the, the fiscal framework, I don't think that the agreement envisaged, envisaged these circumstances, and therefore I don't think there is enough flexibility to deal with such a shock. That said, of course, um, the shock could be to the whole of the UK. It might have a disproportionate impact on Scotland. We're seeing some of the evidence around that, whether it's working age population, impact on GDP, or a whole host of, of, of other matters. Um, as it stands right now, of course, in the GTP statistics were outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom, contrary to what the Fiscal Commission um, forecast. I just uh, gently um, throw in there. Um, but uh, it's a material uh, consideration. Um, the issue for us really then is how we could um, respond to those challenging economic circumstances. I think it's true to say that Brexit was a bit of a Tory gamble, then a guddle, now it is an act of economic self harm. We need to see where the negotiations uh, uh, get uh, the UK to. I won't focus on uh, Brexit today, other than to say I think the parameters of flexibility we have are somewhat constrained and limited in those circumstances. Uh, hopefully, we can continue to grow our economy uh, uh, and enjoy success, but it is somewhat challenged by the threat of Brexit right now. Uh, so I'm working within this agreement, but if you look at some of the parameters that constrain us, for example, on the... Um, budget, what, what was budget exchange, the Scotland reserve, how much I can draw down. Even if we have it in the reserve, I'm constrained as what can be drawn down, even if we have it in our resource. And I do think that is a challenge. But look, these are matters that we will return to as part of the review that we've agreed to. But yes, it is a very challenging environment, of course, at the moment with the, the threat of uh, Brexit looming large over us. Patrick, I hope I've not got too much into the territory you wanted to cover. But. Uh, no, it's fine. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, the, the, the review of the framework, you've touched on it briefly with, uh, in discussion with uh, Adam Tompkins, but uh, I'm interested in talking about how that review should take place and, and what the, the early thinking is on the, the, the nature of it, the way it should be conducted. As things stand, in the current plan, it's supposed to take place toward the end of this parliamentary term. Uh, and I, I'd like to suggest that it might be difficult to get any consensus if it's happening in the months immediately prior uh, to an election. And so some, some earlier upfront engagement uh, on the, the broad uh, approach to it might be useful. The, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury didn't seem very interested in getting into that discussion uh, last week. I'm wondering whether the Scottish Government is yet giving any consideration to how it should happen. Uh, and obviously, I would hope we would all agree it shouldn't uh, take the form of the UK Government reviewing and then imposing its solution. But also, it's not going to be simply a matter of the Scottish Government saying what it thinks should happen. So how do we get a, an open, collaborative, participative process uh, that, uh, that doesn't repeat the the breakneck behind closed doors process of the Smith Commission? No, I appreciate the, the question, convener, and the, the way in which it's been raised. I, d I do want it to be a collaborative um, process coming from the Scottish Parliament as well as the um, Scottish Government. Of course, that review is some time away, and of course, the pressing issue on me is delivering budgets year to year um, and the circumstances therein. But I think it's fair to say that I think the agreement and other members here present we're in the room, we'll know that we have to have an independent review that informs the, 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 the dialogue and decisions with the government. The Joint Exchequer uh, Committee between the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and myself uh, haven't touched upon the review yet, but in the meeting I had with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, I think I underlined the point that because of some of the circumstances that we've touched upon, the, the volatility, the economic challenges that um, UK faces, some of the specific issues we have in Scotland, that would the Chief Secretary continue to be mindful to be flexible on matters when we can show evidence that there may need to be a change of approach? Uh, and the Chief Secretary was open to that. So what I'm 
what I'm indicating is short of the review, can we still have a consensual basis on which we can address issues? And the Chief Secretary said to me she was, um, she was certainly open to that. But the overall fundamental review, it was my understanding that it was to be one full Parliament's worth of implementation and then delivered the review because there are substantial issues at stake here, including the, the model that's used, indexation, for example, eh, or the limits or the other arrangements around our powers. So I think it is something we'll all have to give time eh, to reflect upon, and I want to do it in a collaborative way. So I'm open, open to further discussion with the committee in that regard. Could I just uh, make the suggestion that there ought to be some good agreement between the two governments and hopefully with the input of, of parliaments as well by this time next year, not about the whole detail, but about how this is going to be taken forward and, and what kind of timescale there will be for public involvement, for transparency around it, for open participation and for, for other stakeholders to comment. Because if we, if we get into 2020, if we get, go past 2019 and into 2020, the atmosphere will inevitably become pre-election, uh, you know, perhaps a, a little bit more battle lines being drawn and, and less space for any kind of discussion about this. Yeah, I, I appreciate that point, Camille. I'll certainly take that up. Um, and I think that analysis of, of the politics and the, uh, the heightened political sensitivities is fair. I'm not sure that will be top of the Treasury's list of things to do at that point in time. <coughs> uh, so I'm happy to post-Brexit negotiations, pre-Scottish Parliament elections, make sure that we have the space, the time and the opportunity to do this right and in a transparent fashion. Thank you. Um, Angela, I think that kind of plays into the area you were interested in as well, does it? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to discuss a bit with the Cabinet Secretary about uh, relationships and uh, working together. And the Cabinet Secretary is uh, perhaps aware of the Public Administration Constitutional Affairs Committee at Westminster. They produced a report um, in July um, that concluded that 20 years you know, after uh, devolution that uh, Whitehall uh, still hasn't really got with the, the, the devolution programme, and that's um, evidence in their structures and, crucially, their, their, their cultures, uh, culture of uh, working. Uh, they also concluded that um, that lack of appreciation and understanding about devolution didn't just go against the principles of devolution, but was also contrary uh, to good governance um, across uh, the UK. And last week we heard from the Chief Secretary, who uh, actually, you know, in fairness, described uh, some of the structures uh, in which, in particular, HMRC, you know, work with the Scottish Government, etc. Uh, and she, you know, talked about some of the other uh, mechanisms. Um, she was obviously positive about uh, relationships and the existing uh, structures uh, to uh, assist with the uh, communication. So I just wondered what your perspective uh, was on the, the existing uh, arrangements. Uh, can we, Ms Constance, ask a good question? We, it depends on the minister and it depends on the civil servant. Maybe that's true of, of every um, uh, government. But in relation to the matters that I deal with, um, there has to be uh, uh, the, the, the structures in place, the Joint Exchequer Committee, there's the Finance Minister's quadrilateral. We might um, disagree over policy, but when it comes to the fundamental workings, we try and go on with what's agreed, because it's important that people have confidence in the competence of tax collection and, and the devolution of powers, be it um, a financial arrangements or anything else. Um, but as Angela Constance is well aware, sometimes some of the detail can be very difficult, whether it was in social security transfer or other powers, sometimes to get everything that Scottish Government requires. There is a sense that um, sometimes the UK Government doesn't get um, a devolution, uh, but there are education processes within the civil service to try and make people aware of devolution and those issues. And in terms of these workings, I have... Uh, uh, vehicles to raise ministerial issues and officials have working arrangements as well. I was watching your evidence earlier on, uh, convener, and um, probing HMRC, for example, in the release of data that, say, the Scottish Fiscal Commission requires. Now, although the Scottish Fiscal Commission is independent of government, we want to support them in getting from HMRC and others the data they need. So we apply pressure when uh, uh, required and where we can. So we try and get as much competent understanding of devolution as possible so we can get on with what's agreed. The politics can be radically um, different, but sometimes the understanding and nature of devolution does depend on the minister and the civil servants 
involved, if you want me to be totally frank. But uh, a greater appreciation of devolution would be helpful. And um, I've clearly expressed to the UK government what helps us and what doesn't help us in terms of uh, the budget cycle, for example, because it's totally it's materially important to decisions that we take. I don't know if that's of some assistance. Just if I can follow up very quickly, convener, I mean, uh, in fairness, I would be interested to know what specifically you would wish uh, Whitehall and your experience to do differently, but also um, what, what we uh, or what you and the Scottish Government could do differently as well, bearing yeah. in mind it takes two to tangle. Uh, to be as concise as possible that devolved administrations have that mutual respect to treat it as another government within the United Kingdom rather than as another department or sub-department of Whitehall. That's how the Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government should be perceived as a nation, as an equal within the arrangements of the United Kingdom and therefore be given our place in that regard, rather than sometimes it does feel as if the administration, all the devolved administrations would share this view. I'm very close to the finance ministers. Sometimes a department of Whitehall or a sub-department of Whitehall that has to be managed. No, we were meant to be partners within those arrangements. You want to be as concise as possible. How would I like to, to be treated as equals to um, the uh, arrangements of, of the United Kingdom? Which government do different? Uh, if we had uh, independence, we'd be certainly seen as uh, an equal to the UK government. Uh, short, as, short of that, it's to try and progress the, um, the, the commitments that we have in terms of the ministerial arrangements that we have, and then the UK government's understanding of what we are doing in Scotland. So we all understand for us to get on with the transfer of powers, we need the operational arrangements to work clearly, whether that's around providing data, whether that's around providing access to the necessary officials, or allowing us uh, to get on with resolving some of the outstanding issues would make us be able to maximise what we've agreed around um, devolution. As I say, the place I would raise any um, dispute would be through, as, as Finance Minister anyway, the uh, Finance Minister's Quadlateral or the Joint Exchequer Committee or directly with the Chief Secretary to Treasury, Chancellor or other Ministers as I've done. Um, so I would raise any concerns directly with them. The other ministerial arrangements haven't worked particularly well to go wider than just my own brief. The Joint Ministerial Council around, say, Brexit negotiations, the uh, Scottish Government most definitely has not felt well involved uh, in that regard. But when it comes to finance, I try and get on with it. Look, can I just press you a bit more, Cabinet Secretary, because you actually didn't, I don't think, answer the question. What would you do differently? In terms of... How, how the Scottish Government, how you operate to improve relationships. That was all about what others can do. I, I don't what think the Scottish Government can improve on what we do in terms of the... No, in, Kavina, in all seriousness, I don't have any... I don't have any complaints from the UK government other than they disagree with our constitutional position. I'm not aware in terms of what I could do differently or what is recommended I do differently with the UK government to try and progress matters that we have um, before us. So I can tell you what I think the UK government should do differently. As to the question, if the committee has suggestions as to what I should do differently to engage with the UK government, I'm interested. One element of change that I don't know if the Chief Secretary highlighted in their evidence session, though, is in recognition that some of the Joint Ministerial Council arrangements or the Joint Ministerial Committee arrangements haven't worked as well. And, and they know the displeasure of the devolved administrations in that regard, is that we're looking at a new forum for the finance um, uh, ministers. Now, that's the finance minister's quadrilateral at the moment. Of course, the Northern Ireland executive isn't operational right now, but, but um, that aside, looking at the meeting of finance ministers to be part of the existing ministerial arrangements. Uh, but, but again, Camino, you're asking me to say what I could do differently, and you're asking why I don't answer that question. You need to tell me what you think I should do differently. I'll send you the list. <laughs> <laughs> and publish it. <laughs> uh, well, I'll get into some specifics now. I think Willie and Neil were interested in the APD and uh, VAT issues. So. Yeah, thanks, Camino. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, could you clear up this issue about the air departure tax? It was raised last week uh, at the committee. I think it was Neil that, that raised it, and uh, Liz Truss said that there was no approach that she was aware of by the Scottish Government to the UK on the matter of the air departure tax and how it affects the Highlands and Islands exemption. And you've written to this committee just yesterday. Could you just clear up for the committee exactly what the position is 
Well, the, the position, uh, convener, is exactly as I've uh, repeatedly reported to this committee, and fortunately, I have the written communication to prove it. And uh, repeated communication. I, I'll give. You know, I know some committee members accuse me of misleading Parliament, and I think it's unfortunate that that that. Um, you know, the reality is I've been totally accurate on this and, and, and other members will have to reflect on what they have said. I can give you, in terms of the question, have I ever approached um, the uh, UK government around the need for notification of the European uh, Union? Uh, I have correspondence that I can share with the committee, um, but I have a letter here from Mel Stride MP, who at the time was uh, the... Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury, I think, or the Financial Secretary of Treasury. See, the reason is that UK ministers have ch changed portfolio in this a few times, so maybe the Chief Secretary of Treasury didn't know because so many other ministers have been dealing with it. But in a letter to me on the 19th of July 2007, I'll read it out because it's pertinent to the question. In our conversation, you expressed your wish to notify the European Commission formally for a Highlands and Islands exemption for your new ADT. I want to reiterate the serious concern I expressed in our call about this approach. So I'm afraid I have a series of, of letters, convener, where, uh, as I've described to the committee, I highlighted uh, the issue of concern. Um, we wanted a resolution from the UK government, and I have a list of correspondence that backs up what I've informed the committee. Now, UK government, to give a whole answer, said they had reservations about notification for the reasons that we understand. We didn't think it was compliant with EU rules, and therefore they didn't want to proceed with notification. Then wrote to me and saying, but if Scottish Government takes on the liability, now, bearing in mind that's historic non-compliance, they might approach Europe. Now, convener, would you seriously expect me to sign up to taking on the historic liability for potential non-compliance of an EU Commission matter? Of course you wouldn't. Um, so what we focused on then was what other resolution can we get to the air departure tax issue? And as I say, I have a correspondence trail that backs that up. And again, I'm trying to be fair to the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. The Financial Secretary to the Treasury has dealt with this issue. The Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury has dealt with this uh, issue. The Economic Secretary to the Treasury has dealt with this issue. And I have consistently dealt with this issue. So, if the committee wishes to see further correspondence, so be it. But I've been totally accurate to this Parliament. So, what you're saying is that it's the UK that haven't made an approach to the European Commission about this? To be fair, only the UK can, because the UK is a member state. Um, Scottish Government can't seek notification. Only the UK Government could do that in any event. I approached the UK Government to say here is a way forward. They said they were reluctant to do that. Uh, understanding the impact ultimately that this might mean for the airlines in Scotland, let's say they had to pay back any support, um, it would just have a horrendous impact on the, the Highlands and Islands. Therefore, we together, in partnership, tried to work on other ways to resolve this issue, and I've put forward other suggestions, such as using the rates and bans, for example. So, you know, we have continued to work on the issue, but it's just true, I can prove it. Not, it's, just, it's just not true to say that I didn't approach the UK government around notification. They have written back to me in those terms, convener. Um, is, it, uh, is other APD issues before we get to VAT? Neil? Um, in your letter to the committee yesterday, you did say I'd like to put on record that the suggestion that there's been no engagement with the UK government on the issue of notic notification is simply untrue. There's, of course, an important distinction between the Scottish government engaging with the UK government on ADT and the Scottish government making a formal request that the UK government notify the European Commission. You've just mentioned there um, that you wrote to the Financial Secretary to the Treasury. Um, can I formally request that you do provide the committee with the, that letter and any other relevant letters and emails that you've sent? OK. Thank you for that. Um, you've also You've also said the Scottish Government doesn't want to take on the liability of risk of the UK Government notifying the EU Commission. You said the UK Government made an assessment of that. What assessment has the Scottish Government made of the chances of the European Commission approving an exemption for Highlands and Islands? Well, first of all, um, the, uh, again, there's an issue about legal advice here, but I think it's in the public interest, and I think now probably a number of people are quite aware, our assessment is that it may well not be compliant 
Therefore, you're asking for notification for something that you think might well not be compliant. So that's our assessment. Um, OK, well, there's either a case to be made or not to be made. And, and you, you seem to be saying that, the, that it may not be compliant. Is that that's your assessment? That's my assessment. OK. Um, as I said before... The and incidentally, I think it's UK government's assessment too, which is why they haven't notified. Yeah. Um, well, as I said before, there's a distinction between engaging and, and, and formally uh, requesting. You, you, and I don't think that distinction has been... Well, let me be clear. Uh, be I formally clear. requested in a letter and they responded um, to me in writing. But you have been happy to give the impression that um, you want to find a solution as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, but you, you, you're not necessarily supporting the actions to find that solution as soon as possible, because as Patrick Harvey said last week, it would uh, make your budget process harder. Uh, last week, the Treasury said that they were working with the Scottish Government in developing options for de devolving APD and um, delivering a, an exemption for the Highlands and Islands passengers. Can you tell us what alternatives to notifying the EU Commission you are working on? Um, how serious are you about those alternatives? And when is air departure tax likely to be devolved? Uh, convener, on the 17th of July in 2017, I wrote to Mel Stride, who was then Financial Secretary to the Treasury. Uh, I said, as you know, under APD, there is an exemption for all passengers flying from the Highlands and Islands airports. However, as we discussed, following careful and detailed consideration of legal advice, it has been clear for some time that an exemption needs to be notified and approved by the European Commission under state rules before it can be implemented for ADT. Again, just further written evidence to the point that have I raised it with the UK government. So it was, it was clear on, on that. Uh, it was then the, the letter that I've referred to. Um, the, the, the reply to my point, my subsequent conversation on on the other um, matters. I, I'd just be wondering. I wonder if the um, if Neil Bibby maybe wants to reflect on the information he's put in the public domain that's inaccurate. But in terms of my attempts to resolve this issue, we um, have been working very hard on this. The current arrangements for air passenger duty, of course, are being uh, delivered by the UK government. If they want to reduce the rates, they can do so now. Uh, to rehearse this issue again, convener, we cannot implement laws in Scotland that are contrary to EU law. Now, we don't know how the world changes post-Brexit, but as it stands right now, we cannot continue the Highlands and Islands exemption like for like. Now, it's aspiration to do that because to impose the tax for the first time on the Highlands uh, and Islands will have a, a, I think the terminology used by High Al is catastrophic impact on the Highlands uh, and Islands. Uh, and that's why this issue is so important to have um, resolved. Us having, and of course, none of this, as far as I know, none of this was raised through the course of the Smith uh, negotiations, the fiscal agreement. This was all new to us at the point of um, trying to implement the tax in Scotland, air departure tax. And genuinely with UK government on identification of an issue around state aid notification, we've genuinely tried to find a way through this. But it is the UK government, it's the member state, they have to pursue notification. It's short of that issue being resolved. Um, there's been no other suggestion from the UK government that works that would be compliant. It, one suggestion I made to the UK government, uh, which would substantially resolve the issue, um, would be for them to allow us to use the, the powers under the rates and bans. That particularly work for short haul flights. But yes, that would require a zero rating for all of Scotland, and that comes at a cost, but that would breach the no detriment principle um, within the Smith Agreement. So we are at an impasse with the UK government. So past that, what have we tried to do about it? So I've set up a Highlands and Islands working group so that all interests uh, can come together to see are there any other ways forward in that regard? Recognising that there seems, I thought there was a consensus to try and address the Highlands and Islands exemption issue so that there's a like-for-like -like exemption going forward. And that uh, I'm happy to share the membership of that working group of the, with the committee, if that's helpful, is going through to try and exhaust the issue to see if there's any other way forward to try and address that issue so that we can, in a satisfactory manner, take on the devolution of the tax. So, convener, I was asked for the detail and I've tried to provide that. We are working very hard to try and resolve this issue, but I'm not going to sacrifice the Highlands and Islands of Scotland um, 
by imposing the tax upon them when we're genuinely trying to work uh, on, a, on a solution to this uh, uh, issue, which I have, in, in terms of a problem, inherited from the UK government, and I do think there's some responsibility on the UK government to find a solution here. Yeah, well, Neil, I know you went in the last discussion, so I'll let you in here very quickly. Yeah, just, just you were also asked when is it likely to be devolved? Well, I can't answer that because the solution it hasn't That's been fine. found yet. That's fine. Well, did you have some stuff on VAT as well? Yeah, thanks, Bruce. I was just hoping to ask a question about VAT. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, last week, uh, Liz Truss said it was, it was a good time to be talking about the fiscal framework and asked if it was a good time to talk about possible future assignment of VAT to Scotland. And she said, we've got a lot on our plate at the moment and let's let existing powers bear in, which is fair enough. But, but post-Brexit, uh, the, the reason that we couldn't assign VAT is understand was that the European Union wouldn't allow different rates within member states. So post Brexit, there's no real reason, is there, why VAT couldn't be fully assigned to Scotland? So, convener, yeah, to, to, again, to be to be clear, it's a good point. All it's been assigned, well, it's the, it's the assignation of VATs that we're receiving, not the power around um, rate setting. Um, I think the power would be more useful, but but that's not in the agreement. It was the assignation, and so the issue around assignation. Uh, and again, of course, the, Mr Coffey makes a fair point. The world has changed. Brexit circumstances mean the constraints upon us, <coughs> upon the UK, and, and, and varying rates, is, is, will be assuming there's an arrangement uh, more flexible. But the assignment issue that we are facing is around then the, the methodology that, that's published and how we think we arrive at the number. I know that the committee has considered before some concern around essentially estimate to estimate. On VAT, we never get an outturn figure, unlike income tax or... Um, de other devolved taxes, because it's estimate to estimate, is quite challenging, could be quite volatile. So I do continue to have concerns uh, about that. We are still trying to stay true to the agreement. I have raised this with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury uh, around my concerns uh, on the volatility. Um, so maybe there will be an opportunity to revisit the issue. Uh, we'll publish the methodology shortly, but there are still outstanding concerns about the fact that it's estimate Based. And I think I saw the Chief Secretary to the Treasury in evidence to the committee rule out any other administrative alternative. Um, so we want to make sure that the estimates then are, are absolutely robust. What I would say to the committee, though, is I think one year's, even though there's transitional arrangements, I think one year's data is probably insufficient, especially when that year is, will be subject to that Brexit turbulence as well. So I think we, we possibly have to look at a longer time frame to understand the impacts of what's happened in relation to to Brexit, the economy, VAT receipts, and, and so on. So, so I think we have to take the time to get that one right, convener. And I have flagged that up to the Chief Secretary. OK, thank you. Murdo. Thank you, convener. I, I want to ask a question about LBTT, but I wonder if I could just ask a follow-up question on the, on the APD issue that we've, we've just touched on. And, and you said, um, Cabinet Secretary, quite, quite, quite fairly, I think, that the issue hung on whether there should be a notification to the European Commission of the Highlands Isles exemption. Treasury had said they would do that, but only if the Scottish Government took full liability for all uh, the risks, both historical and future, associated with that, and that wasn't acceptable uh, to the Scottish Government. Um, if the Treasury were to say they would agree a, a referral, but only if you accepted responsibility for future risks, would that be acceptable? Um, the, well, first of all, we're running close to the clock on Brexit anyway, so we'll be asking notification from an organisation that apparently we're leaving. But I think the Chief Secretary, when she came last week, said that she expected that any future arrangement with the EU would include an element of uh, us adhering to state aid rules. The, try, if, well, it depends what state aid rules are, of course. All this is subject to negotiation. So, in fairness, I've been asked a hy hypothetical situation without knowing any of the legal parameters. So, it would be ill judged to me to that, try and sit with us. I'm genuinely trying to be as helpful as possible. Uh, if there was future liability issues, the problem we would still have, if the legal advice is that we're not compliant, that cannot be passed in the Scottish Parliament. So, I would still do not pass go. The, the law officers would not allow it. So that hypothetical situation doesn't even get past the consideration of the law officers. Something would have to be compliant for us to be able to take it forward in a legislative fashion in the Scottish Parliament. So, so, yeah, so what you've said is this whole question of who has the risk therefore is irrelevant. Because even if Treasury did underwrite the entire risk, if, it, if the law officers tell you that there's a compliance issue, you couldn't, you couldn't proceed. 
If something was illegal, yes. Yeah. So but the question they, is, who bears the risk we, therefore is irrelevant? Yeah, I mean, we are in the bounds of total speculation of a hypothetical situation, but if there was some way around it that addresses the legal compliance, the fiscal problems, the, um, uh, the historic legacy and any risk going forward, would I like the power? Well, if we can resolve all of that, it makes it more attractive than where it is right now. Uh, hopefully, the Highlands and Islands Working Group will come up with a more practical solution than the one that's been presented okay. to me by Mr Fraser. OK, thank you. Um, that wasn't the question I was going to ask. <laughs> I'm relieved. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to. I want to ask you about um, LBTT. Um, there was an announcement on Saturday from the Prime Minister that the UK government is publishing a consultation on changes to SDLT, uh, looking at introducing a surcharge on SDLT for non-UK resident purchasers of property, uh, and the suggestion is this will be between one and three percent of the surcharge. Now, I appreciate this is only a consultation. Uh, and it's a very early stage, and I don't expect you to reveal at this stage what might be in your budget. But if the UK government proceeds down this route, is it something you think Scotland should follow suit on? I, I genuinely can't answer that question without seeing the detail, but I will um, advise the committee that I've asked the information from the UK government to see how they think it would work. So, of course, I would look at the, the contents of the consultation um, and, of course, understanding the nature of the fiscal framework and the relationship we have. If they do something on LBTT and we don't match it, then there's a, a financial outcome to that. So, of course, I have to look very closely at what they're proposing. So once I have the detail, I'll certainly look at it. And I've already, as soon as I saw the announcement, I had no earlier awareness that the announcement was coming. So uh, I'll certainly react to it when I have all the information before me. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Tom, I realise that there's potentially questions in an earlier session, which you, you came in a supplementary. Was there <coughs> any remaining things you wanted to ask? It was just very briefly, Cabinet Secretary spoke earlier how the Scottish Government supports the work of the Independent Scottish Fiscal Commission, for example, in pressing the UK government, pressing HMRC rather, to provide sufficient data if that is required. Are you satisfied that the level of data and the robustness of the data provided by HMRC is sufficient? And is there sufficient data on, for example, non-devolved taxes such as um, income tax from dividends, which can act as an indirect indicator of behavioural change, for example, people shifting their income from um, income tax to um, dividends via setting up limited companies? Um, so there's, there's many elements to that question, Camino. Fundamentally, I, I ask officials, are we assured that the SFC have the data they need. They have been clear on some of the data requirements that they require. We're working through that, and we're trying to support them to get what they need from HMRC. Um, and I was watching the evidence from HMRC earlier as well. And, of course, they described the level of accuracy on income tax to about 98 99%. So, you know, I have to, we've got a service level agreement with them and then described comprehensively how they identify Scottish rate taxpayers. Um, the matter of uh, beyond the compliance issues that Mr Fraser raised uh, into the wider issue about do some people then go for incorporation to maybe pay a corporation tax rather than income tax, um, rather than non-savings and non-dividend um, uh, income, we will have to, of course, watch that very closely to see what the behavioural effects are. That said, Scottish Fiscal Commission do make an analysis of what they think the tax behaviours are. They quantify um, that, so I think they'll have to look very closely at uh, all the, the relevant data to, to make sure that they feel that they're robust in the assessments that they're given us. Notwithstanding everything you heard earlier, the income tax figures uh, that we have take into account the behavioural impacts of our policy as well. Thank you. OK, I think can concludes questions from the members. I thank the Cabinet Secretary's officials for their evidence. At the start of the meeting, we agreed we'd take the next items in private. I now suspend this meeting to allow the witnesses to leave. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary.